Great divide. Here, I want us to <clears throat> think of the uh, contextualization issues um, as we make it, say, 1 to 5. We're not talking about C 1 to 6 here, so we haven't come there yet. But contextualization on C 1 to 5, and then it comes to the great divide. And this we would <clears throat> call low contextualization. This we call high contextualization. And uh, <clears throat> so then the great divide is where you come over into syncretism, and then you'd have low syncretism and high syncretism. So high syncretism would say there's no difference between Islam and Christianity, okay? And the question that we're dealing with here is right in here. At what point are you a high contextualist and other people are saying you're a low syncretist? So that little thin line is difficult to define. Difficult in the sense of what, who you are and what you're trying to do, difficult in the receptor audience, and uh, difficult in other people analyzing you. Um, so there's a lot of controversy here, <clears throat> people feeling that syncretism has uh, been breached by evangelicals, okay? Okay, so often the primary barrier in sharing the gospel with those of a different culture or religion is a social better barrier rather than a theological one. Many of our Christian traditions and practices hinder the understanding of the meaning of the gospel and the beauty of salvation through Jesus. What can we do to overcome the situation? This is something I came up with many years ago in Bangladesh. And put in the center here, biblical authority, Christ is God, and salvation is Jesus. And this is not uh, a, a total faith statement. This is just picking out some things that cannot be uh, compromised. And uh, can't say, okay, we don't like that, so we'll, we'll make it something else. <clears throat> so these could be <clears throat> identified as absolutes. And then there are other things around here, like Western worship songs, Western style holidays, eating pork, church architecture, wedding traditions, burial traditions, casket on the uh, Westerner side, prayer forms, use of the symbol of the cross. I'll just stop there and mention in Philippines, um, we finally saw a Filipino come to Christ his wife was not a believer, she's Muslim. And so he was very anxious for her to come to the Lord. So he said to her, will you not go to church with me on such and such Sunday morning, which was a good evangelical, very rousing, alive church. And she consented to go. So they went to church and uh, music, preaching, everything was there. It was good from our point of view. And it actually it was quite a Western style uh, church presentation which is common in the Philippines. Evangelicals brought the gospel to the Philippines and, and it's really uh, very much, very similar uh, church services to America. And, and Filipinos are very lively people. They like lively music and uh, so after the church service they're walking out and he anxiously looks to his wife and says what do you think? And she looked at him and said, um, I felt like throwing up the whole time. Felt like throwing up the whole time. Now, this is absolute 180 degrees around from what he had hoped he would hear from his wife. And he said, well, what is the problem? I mean, what upsets you so much? And she said, you know, behind that preacher at the church, there was a big cross. And I had to sit there and look at that preacher and the cross behind the preacher the whole time, and it made me want to throw up. Now, this is just a, a kind of a, a Muslim lady that wouldn't be 100% involved in all the spiritual dynamics, uh, kind of semi-secular, not overly educated, but she knew about the cross. She knew about the Crusades. She had heard about the violations even in the Philippines because it's majority uh, Roman Catholic population and she sees the cross everywhere in the Philippines and 
what to her is a worship of Mary. All those processions with Mary out there, I mean, that is so horrible to Muslims. They know, Muslims in the Philippines, they know that Christians worship Mary. And they have all the proof texts in the parades, in the churches where Mary is actually, her statue is higher on the part of the steeple of the church than Jesus. Jesus is under her. That's actually a church I went by going to the center every four days a week. There's Mary and there's Jesus. So, of course, as the Quran seems to indicate, Mary is a part of the Trinity and Mary is God and Christians worship Mary. So, um, <clears throat> in all of this stuff, the repugnance of a, a church service where it was kind of in your face type of thing just made her turn off and want to bomb. Now, the good news is that cross which she hated and upset her physically is now the cross she loves because she came to Christ and has become a great believer. But let me tell you, process, right? Long process of explaining all of it. This is why we don't want to bring Muslims to church, okay? Um, it, it, in most cases, it just it overwhelms them with all the, the negativity that goes on in a church. So I'm not saying never, and sometimes Muslims say, I'd like to go to church, see what it's like. But we were talking earlier that maybe uh, like an a evangelical Lutheran church or a Brethren church or something more formal for the first entree rather than something so exciting and loud and boisterous and casual. Casual is a key word there. Um, it, you know, our daughter and son-in-law go to this great church, 3,000 people in, in uh, California, but I would never, ever want to take a Muslim to that church. Um, the women's dress styles are California style, where it's hot and where you're casual and where there's no feeling that a bit of exposure of flesh is any problem. And uh, I personally am kind of taken back by the whole scene. But uh, Californians don't see anything wrong with that. And, uh, and then some of the uh, music styles and various things. So fine for us. I'm not trying to be down on any church. I'm just trying to put this in a Muslim context that uh, certainly, as they live in the West, maybe they're loosened up, and maybe it's okay, but then maybe again it's not okay. And there again, you have to work through this and know. Okay, so <clears throat> other things, uh, Western denominations, so we date and style of worship. Uh, the Western denominations misunderstood religious terminology, birth ceremony, circumcision, and frequency of fasting, use of Christian names, having dogs as pets, uh, use of pictures of Jesus, pick different clothing for worship. Now to me, this is my own spin on this, these are all peripheral. Nothing here is central to the gospel presentation. And they can be done away with, they can be modified, they can be explained, but all of these things here could be so offensive to the Muslim who's hearing the gospel that it can cause them to turn around and to leave before they get to the actual gospel presentation. So that's bad news, not good news. Does that make sense? So the whole thing that we're trying to do <clears throat> as we come to the Bangladesh case study is look at all of these things and say, how did you work with it? What did you do to try to make it less offensive and more positive? Okay, so now we're into this whole controversy that we've been talking about. How many of you um, have really gotten into the C1 to C6 stuff? You've read about it, you understand it a bit. Okay, so most of you. So I don't have to spend great time in just explaining it. You pretty well know the perimeters of it. Traditional church structures using local Christian language reflects Western churches and practices and styles. C2, traditional church structures, forms use a Muslim-oriented vocabulary. C3, <clears throat> contextualized church structure, Muslim arts, culture, language are reflected in the worship and ecclesiology of the church. The same as C3, along with the utilization of biblically acceptable Islamic forms, rituals, and ceremonies, 
Christ-centered communities of Messianic Muslims who have accepted Jesus as Lord. That doesn't tell you anything. We're going to come back to C5 because that's way too brief. C6, small Christ-centered communities of secret underground believers. I'm not sure C6 should be in this graph. The reason being you can't produce a church, can't expand, can't be a church planning spectrum if it's just secret believers. It stops right at the point of the believer because he can't share for whatever reason a secret believer. Okay, be that as it may. <clears throat> the varying views on C5. It, when we started this thing out in 75, um, I was a radical because I was the leader of the team. This is not a Phil Partial thing, it's a team thing, but I was the leader of the team and I wrote a bit and spoke a bit. And so many people were suspicious in the Muslim outreach community of missionaries were very suspicious of what we were doing. They felt this is too far, it's, it's bordering on syncretism. So we were <clears throat> always at, a, at about the C4 level, always have been, and are today. So that's uh, 40 years, let's see, 25, 35 years later. So um, at that time I was a radical, today I'm a conservative. So it's, it's all interesting in 35 years to go from radical to conservative and not change a thing, basically. But events around us have changed a lot. And so <clears throat> whereas C4 was an exciting, new, emerging, uh, and it was, God was using it in Bangladesh, thing, but it was also heavily criticized. Now C5, and I understand kind of the ethos of the C5ers. They are saying we can do more, we can do new things, and uh, C4 is stuck in the mud, and uh, let's go out and experiment, and uh, let's see what God is going to do. <clears throat> so uh, there's this whole group of C5 people. So here are some of the characteristics that some of them use. Now the important thing here is to realize that some people are here like take number one and two, but they don't take three and five, they may take four. So when I say C5, there's an ambiguity. You really need to understand that. This is why I'm not sure <clears throat> it hasn't lost its uh, usefulness because if somebody stands up and says I'm C5, my first question is what do you mean by that? And, but I'm just listing some of the issues that it could mean to an individual. So, varying views. Should believers be identified as Muslim or as Muslim follower of Isa or Isa Masih? In other words, should Muslim have a qualifier to it um, and not just be, I am a Muslim. So a Muslim convert, does he just continue to say I'm Muslim or does he begin to, to say, I'm a follower of Isa, I'm a believer, I'm a Muslim follower of Isa, or something? The difference between the standalone word, which reflects where they have been theologically and everything else, socially, that now um, <clears throat> in the new faith, what do we say about their identification? Can the Shahada, there's no God but God and Muhammad's prophet, be affirmed implicitly or explicitly as a syncretism or deceit to declare Muhammad as a prophet of God. Should believers do the Salat in the mosque? If so, should this be only for Muslim converts? Or is it permissible also for foreign missionaries or for local nationals of Christian background? Should converts be encouraged to remain temporarily in the mosque? Or does C5 strategy and vision the believers remaining permanently in the mosque as a means to win Muslims to Christ, do converts, local Christians, or missionaries officially convert or reconvert to Islam. Okay, okay, <clears throat> and the, we've already talked about the type of terminology that can be confusing, but please, if you don't get anything else on the C5 controversy, understand that different people have different views on C5 within the C5 context, so don't put everybody in a pigeonhole, say, oh, you C5, therefore, he believes all of this. That wouldn't be fair to the C5. And I, I think, um, okay. Here's the latest, okay, the latest controversy that is swirling 
in Muslim evangelism all over the Muslim world where people are laboring to win Muslims to Christ. And it has to do with translation. And it has to do with taking Son of God out of the Bible. All right, pardon? <laughs> um, how many have heard of this controversy? Raise your hand. Well, we've got an informed group here, okay. It has been going on for a couple years, but it's still boiling big time out there. Um, the actual pro-people on taking Son of God out of the Bible are just trying to lay low mm -hmm. and say, don't, just leave us alone. <laughs> Enter Rick Brown. Do you know that? Who knows the name Rick Brown? Okay, Rick Brown is the kind of Islam translations expert for SIL or Wycliffe, okay? Worldwide. And he's super intelligent, PhD. He spent his whole life in this and big on the Islam side. So he enters in and says, good translation means that we are trying to reach the audience with something that communicates what we want to communicate, not something that we got in our mind, but they're going to receive in an appropriate way of what is the text, the Bible, is actually saying. So it, it starts back with, with uh, my good friend that I've been talking about, I want to keep using his name, um, who was a promoter of C5. So the, the latest thing that he got into and started promoting uh, was deletion of Son of God from the Bible. <clears throat> so he now has been very effective in going to different countries and taking like Gospel of Mark or, or some gospel and uh, for initial translation, but it's gonna to move toward the whole New Testament and just in the translation, taking out Son of God. And so enter in other uh, alternatives um, as uh, Jesus Messiah, Esau Messiah, um, something beside that denotes the physicality of Jesus as son and the idea of biological birth, all of which we like, we don't understand it ourselves, but we'll learn it, we'll, we'll get it on Friday. But, um, it is this mysterious concept, uh, and we'd like to think of it in metaphysical terms, but it's actually biological terms because Jesus actually became a man. So I don't know how you can delete the biological process even when we say we want to think metaphysical because he was God, but you still got to put biological in there because he was man, and he came from the womb of a woman and whether, whatever you want to do, we've all decided we don't have a sperm in there, but what have you done with the egg? Now, when a village guy asks me that question and says, we talk about this virgin birth bit, but didn't, didn't Mary contribute the egg to Jesus' birth? I said, well, I don't think the Bible says anything about that. It talks about, the, about Joseph being a non-entity in the process, but she was definitely an entity in the process, and so was there an egg impregnated by the Holy Spirit, or was it a fertilized egg impregnated by the Holy Spirit? Now, if I've lost you, I've lost myself too. So anyway, the point is, um, they're trying, some Muslims are trying to, to work through this and say is how much of this is actual physical uh, from Mary's, uh, how much of it's virgin birth and where did the, the, uh, the egg come from? We talk about sperm. Anyway, that's not the big issue. The big issue here is Son of God is repugnant to Muslims. Okay, let's start there. It is totally blasphemous to Muslims. And they think of it as a Greek incarnation of gods, a Hindu incarnation of gods, all of which is there historically. And so here comes God doing this miraculous thing to make Jesus his son. Um, and they do believe in the virgin birth. I mean, most Muslims believe in the virgin birth. Quran indicates the virgin birth. 
but they do not believe that he came out God. He came out a prophet, right? We track them together. He came out of the womb only as a prophet, not as God. So however the process is not really the most relevant thing. The main thing is, who is Jesus? So they would say prophet, of course. All right, now, back to us. So we're saying, sure, prophet, priest, king, son of God, divine. We're saying all kinds of good things about Jesus that they don't believe. But the most blasphemous thing comes down to them as an incarnated deity uh, becoming a man because God cannot become a man. God is sovereign, powerful up there. We are to worship him. We're uh, all of this, but, but he's not going to be down here walking around and going to the bathroom and eating naan, and, and it, this is just not going to happen. How can, I mean, God can do anything if you try to push him on that. Can't God do anything? God can do anything, but would he? Therefore, they would say no. Obviously, no. It's not in his character as God to do that. All right, so now we, I'm pushing a bit on Friday stuff, so I apologize for that. But um, the, the thing then is, okay, Mark, first verse, Jesus, Son of God, okay? So in your face type of thing. So if you take that out and call beloved, beloved one of God, this is one of the translation replacements, beloved one of God, um, or Esau Messiah, um, does uh, Son of God and Jesus the Messiah appear in the same verse anywhere in the Bible? <clears throat> Can anybody give me an illustration where it appears in the Bible? It's Jesus the Messiah and Son of God. I look here if I've got them. Okay, I got them. All right, Matthew 16, 16, if you're interested, Matthew 26, 63, John 20, 31, John 11, 27. All right, if these two terms are equal and you've got one term that is not offensive, the other term is very offensive and doesn't communicate really what we want to communicate, it just turns Muslims off, why not delete so the argument goes? Why not delete the Son of God, put in Esau Masih, and we're tracking. We're on the way. And the most famous part of one of these here, I'm not sure which verse it is, but it's Peter's confession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Okay? So there you got just in that verse. But those other verses that I just gave you are also there. So... You get the argument, if it's the same, then take out one that's not difficult and leave the other one. One that I have less problem with is the uh, Word of God. Jesus says the Word of God. Even in Peter's confession, you are the Word of God. Because then you can go back to the Quran and say, okay, God has His Word and His Spirit. Jesus is the Word of right. God. So it's Quranic in that way. <coughs> And then you can go further and say, okay, and let, if he didn't have his word forever, then he has something additional. So he must have had his word eternally. So therefore, the word of God, i.e. Jesus, must be eternal. So you can almost use that argument if you replace that with the word of God. What have you done to the Greek? You've uh, obliterated it, right? <laughs> you've taken the original and you've obliterated it by what? Uh, SIL would like to call functional substitute. Does anybody have an NASB here? No American Standard Bible? Yeah. Look up um, John 1.18 and tell me what it says. Uh, so different versions are going to say different things and I think we'll find John 1.18 in a NASB says something pretty blasphemous as far as Muslims are. Go ahead. What would a Muslim think reading that verse in John? The begotten God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten, what? Son, okay, that's bad enough. But John 1.18 in NASB says begotten God. 
Now, other versions don't say it quite that way. Got another version, NIV? Yeah, well, I have an ESV. Okay. And it says, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So we've already played with some terms. I mean, this NASB is in your face, uh, especially if you're dealing with Muslims talking about a begotten God. Okay, begotten son, we'll have to work with it. We can't get around it. But this, so what these people... <laughs> In the Reformed tradition, ESV, yes, um, they have come up and said, um, uh, what is it, beloved, what was it? Uh, no, it's uh, from the side, the father's side. He, who is at the father's side? Okay. It gives an alternative. Yeah. It the, What's the alternative? It says, or the only one who is God. And it says some manuscripts insert the only son. Okay, so anyway, the, the point is there is vagueness in translations, right? Yeah. But if you go too far in functional substitutes, what do you end up with? Something different. Something different. Um, what, what's the word I'm trying to, uh, Kenneth Taylor's uh, uh, Bible translation? Uh, paraphrase. paraphrase is the word I'm trying to pull up. So you got to write, isn't that correct? I mean, if you go too far, you get too much into the explanation or something that seems to fit right, but it's contextually okay, but it's certainly not uh, textually accurate as far as the original is concerned. You end up with a paraphrase. All right, now, a paraphrase is not a Bible translation, right? Is that not correct to say? I think we could agree with that. A real Bible translation will say what the original says. So some people say. But then there, the other people say it, it shouldn't be wooden and literal. And so it should be that which is communicating contextually and biblically. But it, it doesn't have to say if it's said in the Greek and nobody could dispute begotten God. It doesn't have to say begotten God. It can do what these other other things have said. Now, who's right? I'm not sure because I've forgotten all my Greek. That was a long time ago. Because this is now going on in the Philippines. It's going on in Bangladesh. People, the Bangladesh Bible Society is super upset because the Bible Society guru, Rick Brown, is saying it's an okay thing. And on the ground in Bangladesh, the Bible Society local, Bangladesh Bible Society, this is totally blasphemous. We'll have nothing to do with this taking Son of God out of the Bible. So, my friend goes and raises some money, which he always seems to have great access to, and he just does his own thing. And even as we speak, there are nationals in varying countries around the world in the process of taking Jesus out, taking Son of God out of the New Testament translations that are going on, and then they will take them back. They, they have meetings about twice a year <clears throat> to discuss translation techniques and progress and all this. And uh, then they're taking it back and they'll distribute it and they will proclaim it, and there's not a thing you can do about it. So then there's conflicting translations. Is this causing a problem? Okay, no. let, let me just mention SIL on this con conflict within organizations. <clears throat> Outside the JARS um, uh, part of SIL is near, uh, it's in Waxhaw, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, I guess, near uh, Charlotte. And so Rick Brown and others had a high-powered uh, summit on this subject, because not everybody in SIL agrees with Rick Brown. Now you've got all these very learned guys within SIL, and there are some who are saying you're going too far. And we don't really appreciate being associated with a group that's taking something as precious and as important as Son of God out, and here is our man actually advocating it. Not himself doing it, but advocating it. I'm not saying SIL is doing it, I'm saying they have an advocate within their group who is a very powerful, learned person. So when X group over here does it, that have, and, and this is, so we had to have in SIM a statement on contextualization because we had a couple guys pushing the envelope too far. They were pushing over to C5. So I was on this and we had about four or five of us and uh, <clears throat> we uh, listened to all the arguments from C5 and all the arguments from C4. I mean, we were heavily weighted in SIM with C4. We, we probably only had three or four fellow travelers of C5, maybe only one actual uh, person doing it. 
But we had to come up with a statement because whenever something like this comes, we have to have direction, we have to answer people who ask us in SIM, what is our position? And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we had to say, we stick with Son of God and uh, let the chips fall where they may. Guy resigned. The C5 guy, practitioner resigned SIM. He's a brilliant guy, great guy, loves the Lord, but he had to resign. Isn't this how heresies begin? <laughs> yes. You okay. The Arian heresy, Arius was very uh, serious minded. He thought that he was doing the right thing by saying, well, there was a time when Jesus was not, and yet that was taken to its logical conclusion, and now you have Jehovah's Witnesses today who even believe that type of idea. I just see it as opening up the door for heresies to pop up. And in the Muslim world, we'll have heretical Christians. And there's not a lot you can do about that. I mean, if heresies have been part of Christian history from day one, and uh, it's going to happen now there can be voices of protest. And I have written on this subject, and uh, my voice is out there. And I would say the majority, the, by far the majority, of workers among Muslims are not prepared to take Son of God out of the Bible. They are not. So they say, leave it and explain it and blah, 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 whatever. But we've got to stick with the text. But I wanted to bring it to you because there is this vocal minority that, that's becoming more vocal. They have been very in a corner quiet, but now we're forcing them out because we didn't like them being a non-voice and just covertly doing something that could disturb other Muslim outreaches in the same country, among the same people's group. This is going on right now in Bengali language, and we're not very happy about that. But they're doing their own thing because they can do their own thing because this is the way the world operates. This is the way th life operates. Not the world, but life. Life operates. You go do your own thing. We have heresies all over. We have all kinds of uh, differences all over. This is why we have 20,000 Christian denominations, Protestant. Hello. Take your choice. 20,000. Muslim convert comes to the Lord. Take your choice. 20,000. Ah. So, yeah, it's going to happen, but it, it is good, I feel, and right, to make our boys heard, to make a protest about something we're uncomfortable with. But uh, live with it, we're going to have to, because they have the freedom to do that. Are, are there any like, national churches you know, in the countries of ministering in that approve of it? Uh, generally speaking, the national churches that are not the MBB group. Uh, so they have been Christians for generations, all right? They're not approving at all. They're saying you're coming up with a total heretical Bible in this sense of Son of God. We're going to talk about this issue of translation a bit um, in making a Muslim-friendly translation. Now, we're going to make a difference when we get to that subject. I am all for a, and you heard this from Jim Dressner, this morning, and, and maybe I'll just go ahead because it's relevant here. In Bangladesh, the translation into Bengali was done by William Carey in uh, about um, 1798. Okay, so William Carey was, worked among Bengalis. His first translation of the Bible in Eastern India was in Bengali language. This is what he spoke most fluently. And so he looked around in Calcutta area, East India, and the Bangladesh area in general. In fact, he first went to an area of Bangladesh and then went over to Calcutta, which is now India. And he looked at that in Calcutta and there was half Muslim and half Hindu population in Calcutta, almost no Christians at all, except the foreigners who came. All right, so now as he looked at this, he's got to look at and put a word for God into the translation of the Bible. All right, now as he, he looks at what the Bible says and its type of uh, linguistics, and he looks at a Hindu, and there's a word Ishor, which is, which is uh, a sub-Christian, sub-biblical word, it's more idolatrous, it's a Hindu 
one of the best of the 10 million gods. That's a word. And then over here is Allah, which is strictly monotheistic, but it's the Muslim word for God, and that's the only word they know as God, and they think Quranic theology. Over here, Ishor, they think Hindu theology. Now, give me some choices that William Carey could use for the first ever Bengali Bible. What are the choices he could use? He could use God. He could use an English word, God, and write it in Bengali script. Therefore, we are purist, North European, German idolatry. That's, that's what that is. But uh, he used the word God, but uh, uh, he didn't do that. Creator? Uh, just to, to not even use the word God, but use an attribute. Creator. Okay, could do that. Translate that into Bengali language as the one who creates. Could do that. What else? Where would you go if you had those choices? How about making up a word so it's pure? You're a purist. You just put a bunch of syllables together. It doesn't mean anything to anybody, but then you put the content in, and context of the Bible, every time God appears, puts a meaning in, and you've got a pure word starting from nothing. How's that? Good idea? <laughs> he didn't have the Google at that time. <laughs> well, you could do that. Yes, you could. And he did not. So he's got a problem. That's this great linguist shoemaker. Came to India, and he's got to do a translation for Bengali. Anybody happy with... Uh, well, what about a biblical Jehovah, whatever? You okay with a good biblical word for God? Theos. That had a poor meaning to start off with, but they redid Theos, right? Okay. Um, you happy to use one of the Hebrew or Greek words for God? For William to do? You're not excited about that, I can tell. All right, then let's go to the next stage. Let's use Allah. Half the population, he's going to communicate to half the population, which is Muslim. And uh, so he uses Allah. Is that okay? In his first ever translation. You're not happy about that. Okay, that leaves one option. Ishar. And this is this idolatrous, 10 million God, best of all God. Small g. Uh, everybody would understand it if he, What? One of the issues here, who's he going to work among? Who's he trying to reach? Well, William was pretty smart. He'd look at those Muslims. They're hard nuts to crack. So I'll go for the Hindus. So he could use Ishar and have a bridge word right away with the Hindu population. Good idea? Or not a good idea? Come on. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Even though it's a bridge word, not a good idea. Okay, why? Okay, good point. You try to use Ishar and evangelize Muslims, you've got a major problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's enough Hindus around to keep you going for a while, mm -hmm. if you decided to do Hindus. Okay, bottom line, won't keep you in suspense anymore about what William Carey did. He was thinking Hindu, definitely. And he started looking into Hindu terminology, and he decided to go with it, and he used Ishar. Okay, and the word Ishor just became inscribed and accepted and interpreted biblically. So Ishor to all of those generations till right today, this moment, is used Ishor in the Bengali Bible and everybody that's using it in the Christian community singing praises to Ishor not thinking about the best of 10 million gods. They're thinking the Bible. Jesus and God. That's what they're thinking. And so he got away with it through process of interpretation, contextual, explaining, um, all of this preaching, and uh, I'm sure tracks, he was great on tracks, but in the actual Bible, 
today, Ishar, walk into a Christian church, Mr. Muslim, sit down and hear a preacher talking about the greatness of Ishar. What's going on in his mind as he hears the most repulsive word theologically? Did you have something you want to say? No. No, I mean, it was just, it was a rock and a hard place. I mean, he could have done the exact same thing and gone with Allah and explained to Hindus, you know, this isn't their same God. I mean, it's all context, like you said. And yep. So, a very difficult situation. Now, here's the deal. I'll go ahead and give you one point of contextualization right here. That when we went out to the field, I'm burdened for evangelism, I want to get literature out, and we do the correspondence school, and we do tracts, and I go around the Muslim areas, and I'm always using Eshore, because nobody else is doing anything except Eshore. All right, enter Vic Olson, Dr. Vic Olson from ABWE Mission in Bangladesh, who's an outstanding surgeon, asked to go as an intern at Mayo Clinic, Rochester. He gives all that up. He goes to Bangladesh. He builds a hospital in the southern part of Bangladesh. He decides, I'm making bodies well for hell. This is his words, not mine. So he says, I'm going to put my, my efforts and my life in, in, in coming up with a, a Bible that communicates now keep the Son of God in mind as we're going through this little thing, that communicates to Muslims because we have Ishor there and that's a complete turnoff in any type of pre-evangelism or evangelism or literature. And he said, I'm going to use Allah. He said, we're going to come up with a new Bengali Bible for Bangladesh and we're going to use Allah and Isa and other terms that that were very Hindu, like in atonement and stuff like this, we could take all of the Hindu stuff out and give an equivalent that is not compromising. Son of God is still there, still there. That is not compromising, but will be understood by Muslims and not like the Hindus. So the Hindu Bible is there and the Muslim friendly Bible is there. And I wanna tell you what happened. If there's any one along with what we were doing over there. Here's Vic down in the south with his wonderful wife uh, putting aside all this great surgery uh, ability and just sitting day after day, year after year, coming up first with a New Testament. So then he has powers of persuasion, six foot five or so, and he's a surgeon of repute. And so what he did was start pushing the Bible Society, locally and internationally, to publish this because he felt if the Bible Society was behind a Muslim-friendly translation of the New Testament, initial instance, now it's the whole Bible, but in the initial instance, that it could really get going. This thing could really get splashing out there. Now, the Christian church, what did they say to Vic Olson? Nobody. And the Bible Society, which was local Bible Society, all Christians, local Christians, they went ballistic. You're compromising our faith, you're denying the faith, you're heretical, and you're coming in with, with all your charisma and power and influence, and, and so Vic <coughs> could do nothing locally. So he went to the top of the United Bible Societies. He started putting pressure on them big time. Other people took it up, and we in Bangladesh on the ground just said, of course we need this. We're desperate for something that Muslims will understand that doesn't compromise the integrity of the message. And so, after uh, several years, the New Testament came out with the imprimatur of the Bangladesh Bible Society in colors of green with some Muslim artwork and then Operation Mobilization as part of our SIM coverage. They took this New Testament with their core of uh, Cole Porters and they went all over the country distributing, selling at a cheap price this beautiful, just paperback with Muslim artwork and decor and color and understandable language. And I want to tell you that was an absolute key to the movement of people to Jesus Christ from Islam in Bangladesh. And I give Vic Colson, who is one of my close friends, he's now retired, his wife's had a lot of physical problems. We saw him about a year, two years ago, I guess, uh, in California. They don't live too far away from our daughter. But 
Uh, we have had so many testimonies of Muslims who, through the correspondence school, because we used it in the correspondence school, Muslim friendly language, we switched over from all the Hindu language, and Muslims all over the country out in the most furthest remote areas as these coal porters would go out there and sell cheaply this beautiful New Testament, it was a key to getting the gospel to the hearts of Muslims. Now, to me, that's exciting. That's very exciting. I understand why Kerry did what he did, okay? I mean, he was a product of his time, and uh, he just felt this was the proper way to go. He's very anxious to communicate, and he felt that any other way would not communicate well with the Hindu population. But he left us out in the cold for generation after generation after generation. We couldn't, we couldn't do anything with East Shore. So in 1975, mid-70s, that became part of our whole contextual outreach. Do you have any problem with that? You okay with that? As far as we could tell, and the Bible Society did come around and other missions came around, and if you were in Bangladesh today, you would uh, see that um, this, is a, this is the way <clears throat> we have gone and, and it's been very, very, very successful. Does Ishore live on? Yes. You're not going to change that church. Do a lot of church members hate the fact that there's some kind of Muslim-friendly translation out there that's semi-heretical or totally heretical? That's the way they feel inside. Emotions. And, and history, legend, how we've come down the pike is part of us. So we have an emotional response, even if it doesn't make a lot of sense um, as, as to who we are. And so to them, God is Ishar. Can't, how can God ever change? Those Muslims persecute us. Those Muslims give us hassles. Those Muslims who are a majority population in Bangladesh, they don't give us jobs. And, uh, and they look down on us. This is talking about the... the the Hindu background Christian church. And so to switch over and use their word for the God that we love, uh, which is Ishar and Jishu for Jesus, and start using Isa, is unsatisfactory. And they fight it. Right? We, have, we have fighters in Bangladesh. So you're fighting for a cause that to them is not a straw man. To them, this is a faith issue. We're fighting for something that is absolute faith issue. So do you see how complicated it is? I'm not <laughs> I would say, how can we ever be a missionary with all these problems? <laughs> no, it's challenging. But you're going to end up a, a long life's way and we'll come to target group, a delineation of target group. You're going to come to a place of saying, I like the way Pakistan's presented. We've got a, a target group, okay? So you get in, dig in, go deep, learn language, get the culture, get in with the people, start relationships, and let the rest of the world go by. I mean, you're not going to solve all the rest of the Pakistan issues. They've got all those people's groups. You're not going to solve all that. But uh, you can make a difference. And uh, that's what our team started, and that's what Vic Olson started, and started the modern uh, contextualization movement among Muslims. It's been exciting. It's been very rewarding, very thrilling to, uh, to have walked into this. Uh, it was very interesting, just to sidelight. <clears throat> we had a missionary from a good mission, but a very conservative mission, faith mission type, interdenominational. And this guy's an engineer, but he's very smart in theology and very dedicated to the Lord, but very severe person. And uh, he was in, I think, Morocco, as I try to reconstruct that. And uh, he was so upset with our team. He felt it was going to start some, a movement of Muslim-friendly languages. And this word, Isa, was blowing him out of the water. He said, you cannot use this word, which is common by Muslims. Actually, Isa is thought to be from Syria, Syriac, and uh, actually predates Islam. I was just reading this yesterday from Dudley Woodbury's article. He's uh, the big guru of Islam from Fuller Seminary. And so the, the thought is that Isa was around pre-Islam for Jesus, okay? And so this guy in North Africa 
a very sincere guy, and he, he was so upset with our team that we dared bring Jesus, the Son of God, the biblical God, down to the level of Islamic usage, which is just profit. So you can see his understanding, right? I mean, how he's going, where he's coming out. So, I mean, we thought a long time about that before we adopted Isa. And uh, we thought pre-Islam, and we can explain that to Muslims and things, and, and they have a high regard for Isa Quranically, although it doesn't reach to the point where we would like it to be. We felt that it was a bridge word. Rather than Jishu or Yeshua or whatever, that won't mean a thing. So, I went to Morocco and had couscous. We all sat around this table, the couscous in the middle. And uh, so you're taking the food out from there. And, and so I'm looking at these very severe missionaries there. Really, this is heavy stuff. Parcels come to town. It's going to make a defense of contextualization. And the biggest item on the agenda is ESO. And uh, so I said to the folk, oh, I'd like all of you to, uh, to enter into the discussion, say maybe six people from their mission. And with one accord, they said, no, 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 it's between you and him. <laughs> I said, we're watching. <laughs> okay. And so then he starts in and, and gives his own view about taking Jesus down to a lower level than he should be uh, because of Islamic interpretation. And especially because we are dealing with Muslims and therefore it was inadequate. So he goes on he, and he, he's quite animated and I would... Maybe angry is too heavy of a word, but he was upset. That's a good word. He was upset with me, us, our team. And I said, um, could I ask you one question? And I said, do you use, in your translations and preaching, do you use Allah? And I said, you know, there are those in our country, in Bangladesh, that think we're compromising by using Allah. It's a horrible thing to use a Muslim word for God. But I come here to Morocco, and all of you Arabs, you're all using Allah. Certainly you come up with a better functional substitute than the Islamic sub-biblical word for God. You're using it. Why don't you think of something else? Allah is inadequate. Like you're saying, Isa is inadequate. So aren't we doing the same thing? That's the first time I saw him not knowing how to answer. He just looked at me and said, well, we'll have to think about that. <laughs> Well, obviously, they're not going to change Allah and the Arabic language for God, whether it's Muslim and Christian combined or not. Okay, let's take a